I'm David Berlin, Editor-in-Chief of Programmable Web, and we're here with part five of our 11-part video series on APIs 101. Now, if you're looking for a beginner to intermediate level conversation about APIs, you've come to the right place. We won't do a really deep dive, won't be super technical, but it'll be enough to make you smart enough to talk in just about any conversation that's covering the topic of APIs in an intelligent way. Now, what is this series covering? We'll just kind of rehash this. Number one, what is an API and how does it work? Number two, why should you invest in an API program in your organization? Number three, why should you think of APIs as products and not as some sort of second-class citizen in your organizations? Number four, APIs are something that go on the internet or maybe on your corporate network. In either case, making them secure is extremely important. We'll talk a little bit about that in one of our future parts of this video series. And number five, what is API first design and why is that methodology important for designing your APIs and then launching them? And finally, at the end of the series, we're going to get some hands on. We're going to build some APIs and then we're going, to, we're going to consume them. Now, if you haven't seen the previous four parts of this series, I strongly encourage you to stop now and go back, go back and watch those other four parts because they contain some very useful information that will help you, help you to understand this particular part of the series. So just to kind of rehash a little bit, we talked a little bit about how APIs are user interfaces just for a different end user, not a human being. We also talked about the analogies in the real world that kind of metaphorically demonstrate the idea of what we call an API contract, the wall socket, Lego, and shipping containers. That contract can be specified in very technical terms like measurements of the studs that are on Legos. We also talked about how APIs provide a great deal of flexibility. They allow you to make substitutions, for example, in terms of what is serving your functionality to all of the different API consumers, be they web apps, mobile apps, desktop applications. It doesn't matter. If you can make some changes, you have the ability to drive down costs, drive innovation. We also talked about how to think about taking your existing infrastructure, which may be very monolithic and intertwined in nature, breaking it up, thinking in seams, finding the parts that can be decomposed and then retied together using APIs. So in this series, in this part of the series, we're going to talk about what is the API economy. Okay, so if you think about all the technologies we've talked about so far, the idea of taking some discrete functionality, turning it into a service, making that service available through an API, putting it on the internet, and then making that available to all of the different API consumers out there, the developers who are building applications that might consume that functionality or the data that's provided by that API. We take all of those things together, and now we have what we call the API economy. Now, this sort of demonstrates, this slide here demonstrates the idea that you've got a bunch of services on a network and they're all sort of interconnected to each other. But you can imagine that the API economy consists of many more services than we are showing here. But the important part is, is that because so many of these services are offered on relatively the same terms over the web, for example, that it starts to form a cohesive ecosystem that we refer to as the API economy. Now, programmable web tracks the API economy very closely in all the different parts of it. And here's some basic uh, structure behind our directories. For example, of course, we track APIs on the far most left, but we also track applications and something called a mashup. These are the types of apps that consume APIs. We have a separate directory just for the SDKs, the software development kits that make it easier for developers to consume APIs. And then the other tooling, for example, libraries and frameworks. We even have sample source code that you can come and look at so you can see, oh, here is how I consume the Twitter API using Python or using JavaScript. And as you can see, we have an underlying taxonomy that shows you the languages that are supported by some of these components and the companies that provide them. So for example, we might be able to give you a slice of just those SDKs that are for developing with JavaScript or just those APIs that come from Amazon. That's what that underlying those underlying strips are behind these various boxes. Now, within each API, we also maintain a whole bunch of different metadata. And this is just a sample of the metadata we offer. For example, architectural style. You may hear terms like REST, and push and streaming, RPC, GraphQL. These are all architectural styles behind the APIs that are out there on the web. No two APIs are exactly alike. They all use different architectural styles. But we try to track that so you can look through our database and try to find, for example, 
all GraphQL APIs for social networks. We also have what we call the API types, web internet, browser, product, and so on. We're going to go into that in the next video, just giving you a slight breakdown here to show you what's, what sort of information we track on a per API basis. And also the scope of the API. Does it, uh, does it take into account just one piece of functionality, multiple pieces of functionality? Is it a microservice API? This is a new part of our data model. We track that as well. And finally, API versions. Versioning APIs by itself is an art. Most APIs have multiple versions that are out there on the web, and sometimes those versions are completely deactivated. We track all of that information on Programmable Web so that developers can look for the history of APIs and figure out which version in the past or which version in the future, for example, a beta version that's coming, they want to try out with their next application. In this part of the video, we're going to go to David Berlin's ScreenFlow of Programmable Web. Okay, so let's take a quick spin through Programmable Web here. As you can see, we have on the front page of Programmable Web a bunch of news stories, so if you want to keep in touch with what's going on in the API economy, we're publishing new news stories every single day. We're also publishing how-tos and tutorials, a lot of great tips and tricks on how to not only develop with APIs, but how to provide APIs. But going back to the directory, we have a variety of different directories here. We have our API directory, we also have SDKs, sample source code, libraries, frameworks, and the mashups and apps directory. As you can see in the API directory, we have a bunch of APIs that are listed on our front page, but you can always go to the complete directory and see all of them listed here. We list a whole bunch on a per page basis, but if you want to look for a specific API, you could always go to our search box and type in the name of that API, for example, Twitter. When we get to that API, when it comes up in the search results, you'll see that you have one exact match, and you can click on that, and you can dive in, and you can learn about all there is to know about that API, what its endpoint is, where the homepage for the developer portal is, what the primary category is, the secondary categories, and there could be more than one of those here, who the actual API provider is. Sometimes the API provider and the, the actual site are two different organizations, believe it or not. We also have various other bits, of bits and pieces of data. So going back to the, uh, the descriptions we were talking about earlier, we have the architectural style, we have supported request formats and response formats. So this gives you some idea of the data we keep on an API basis. We also can take you to the different SDKs that exist for an API. So here are all the software development kits that we have a record of for developing uh, with specific languages. For example, here's the official PHP SDK that comes from a separate organization, doesn't even come from Twitter. And you can see whether or not the, uh, which language that the uh, SDK is in and also who is the provider of that SDK. Again, we have lots of third party, party organizations developing uh, software tooling of this nature for various very popular APIs like the Twitter APIs. And also from the Twitter API page and any API profile you can take a look at other related assets. For example, what articles do we have that are about that API. So here are all different articles that we've published that have to do with Twitter. Now if you're somebody who's got an API and you want to add it to the API directory, it's very simple. You just go to this button up here and click API and of course, there you go, here's the form where you enter all that data, much of it, the data that we discussed already when we talk about describing APIs. For example, here are those types, the browser, the product, the standard, or the system embedded, or the web and internet. Here are the different uh, styles, architectural styles that we support. And the scope, remember we talked about we had meta service and microservices and, and single purpose APIs. The meta service API, by the way, that's the same as the aggregate API. So this gives you some example of how it is that we're describing APIs. You can pick categories for it, anything from like social to addresses, adoption, and then you can pick secondary categories for it. This is how we maintain our API directory. So if you have an API that you want to add to it, it's very simple to put it in there and it's free. And just be prepared to fill in all of those different fields because what we do is we use those fields to enable searching across of our database for our other users later. So there you go, that's what it looks like on Programmable Web. Now, one thing to think about when you consider all of these APIs that we're tracking on Programmable Web is that we're just scratching the surface of the number of APIs that are going to show up in the API economy.
And why is that? Well, one reason is something we call the Internet of Things. You may have heard of this. There's a lot of buzz about it. Fitbits, uh, camera, uh, nanny cams, all kinds of uh, different devices that are being put on the Internet, devices, industrial devices that have sensors, cars, you name it. They're all going on the Internet now in a way that they're accessible through APIs. And so if you imagine that the Internet of Things may be having somewhere between 30 and 50 billion more devices added to the Internet between now and the year 2020, that's an extraordinary number of things being added to the Internet, all of which have an API. This will cause a massive orders of magnitude proliferation of the API economy. And so that's why, if you remember, going back to the slide earlier, we had just a few nodes in the API economy. Now, we literally are going to have millions, billions by some estimate. So before, you remember this slide, we talked about how APIs really enabled you to make some substitutions and have uh, your different applications talk to different types of server infrastructures that might be powering your APIs. You can take that IBM mainframe out and substitute Microsoft.NET or Linux in for that IBM mainframe and drive your costs down, move faster, that sort of thing. Well, now with the Internet of Things coming online, we have a completely different image of this idea of API consumers and API providers. Now, anything can talk to anything through the API. If you look at this image here, we have servers, we have web apps, we have mobile apps, Apple and Android with desktop apps, talking through an API to a thermostat or to salesforce.com, to Linux, to a Cisco router, to a Tesla car. And by the way, that communication can go both ways. So essentially, we're talking about anything talking to anything. You can imagine how that will impact the overall API economy when just about everything on the internet is talking to everything else all through APIs. That's the end of this part of our 11-part series on APIs 101. In the next part of this series, part six, we're going to talk about the different types of APIs, something that I just kind of touched on a little bit earlier in this presentation. We're going to go into a little bit more detail on that. So thanks very much and join me for the next video. Thank you.